Next, we want to move over to the next test, which is called the fecal elastase test. And in this test is used for the diagnosis of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So the reason I call it exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is because the pancreas actually has two functions. Endocrine function is actually when it produces insulin, and that's used in the management or in how we diagnose diabetes. But the exocrine function is actually a releases a digestive enzymes, which will help in the, man in the digestion of food. And so when you have pancreatic insufficiency, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, you don't cr um, create enough of those digestive enzymes to help you with digesting your food. And this can lead to malnutrition, weight loss, bloating, and, then, and, uh, and what's something called steatorrhea or fat in your stools. So in comparison to fecal calprotectin, fecal elastase is abnormal when it's low. And so a low level is when it's less than 200 micrograms per gram of stool. And that's because we need those enzymes to digest our food. And so it's an, it's an example of how we don't have enough of that. So there are a number of conditions that can cause you to have a pancreatic insufficiency. One could be because you had a pancreatic surgery or resection of your pancreas. The most common cause though is chronic pancreatitis, uh, which we often see in gastroenterology. And there is a number of causes for chronic pancreatitis. And these include things like gallstones, alcohol, um, pancreas divism, and there's a number of different causes of, of chronic pancreatitis. We also can see a pancreatic excrement in insufficiency in conditions like cystic fibrosis as well as in hemochromatosis. And there's other rare kind of causes of it, including some genetic causes and other conditions that are a little more complicated. But it's important to remember that the most common cause of pancreatic excrement insufficiency is actually um, chronic pancreatitis. So the symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency that uh, can lead to testing would be sometimes people have mild symptoms, and this could be just a little bit of bloating, usually without a change in their um, bowel symptoms at all. The second kind of symptom that people can have if it's moderate to severe is that can, they can get diarrhea and something called steatorrhea, where we often see that the stools are, are really stinky, as well as they there seems to be a, like, there can be a, 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 a droplets of oil on the water in the, in the toilet as well as um, they can be quite difficult to flush. And so often when you're not absorbing your fat, that's when patients can actually are at risk for um, malnutrition because they're not able to absorb those nutrients. So they could be quite thin, as well as you can get um, fat soluble vitamin um, deficiencies. So again, the question comes up whether or not you can actually do a blood test instead of a stool test, because people generally prefer to do blood tests over stool tests. And there is a, a blood test for um, pancreatic insufficiency. It's called a serum trypsinogen, which is actually, um, but it's not quite as sensitive and it's not as good of a test as the, the fecal elastase. And that's why we generally rely on the fecal elastase. There are a couple of other tests that we sometimes do for, uh, to look for steatorrhea. And so that would be a, a Sudan stain, it's a, a stain of your stool for like a fat globules. And then that there's the dreaded 72 hour fecal fat test. As you can imagine, you collect your stools for 72 hours and then they analyze for an amount of fat. And during that time, you have to ingest a, a high amount of fat in your diet to, to see whether or not it's kind of a stress test for your bowel to see if they can absorb fat. Mm -hmm.